only a few questions tonight. So we'll see what we've got here. Oh, well, this one has three separate questions. Actually, it starts here. Six questions. Um, let's see. <clears throat> one, if you are not fully aware and someone gets on your nerves, is it better to avoid that person due to the fact that you're not fully aware of the emotions that may arise and thus not yet fully capable of controlling it? Yeah, to some degree, we need to be honest with ourselves about what we're currently capable of handling. Um, so we want to be careful to protect the mind from unwholesome mind states. So if, we're, if we know that certain circumstances are currently too challenging for us, uh, then it might be best to avoid those circumstances. Uh, for the time being, but making a sincere effort to develop the equanimity and uh, wisdom necessary so that when we do wind up in those situations that we can enter into them without losing one's uh, wholesome state of mind. And if we do wind up in a circumstance where we are over our heads, where we're faced with a situation where it seems like uh, no matter what we do, we get triggered and we fall into anger and irritation and aversion or, or we fall into desire and attachment and obsession or whatever it is. Recognize that it's in fact not out of our depth. It never is. We always, always, always have the opportunity to practice equanimity. Even when it seems like something is too much for us, it's never too much. It's only too much when we give up, when we stop trying. So there's really no such thing as a situation which is beyond our capacity to maintain equanimity in. It's just that some uh, might be more challenging than others. Second question. Is forgetting someone's wrongdoing to you a form of complete love? says in parentheses, forgotten and moved on, but there's some lingering emotion, not hatred, but annoyance. It sounds to me like you haven't actually forgiven the person. Um, but that said, there's, um, if someone hurts you, you might forgive them for it, but you're still going to be cautious around them in the future. Um, so that's understandable. Um, I wouldn't actually recommend forgetting someone's wrongdoing, per se. But forgiving it, uh, recognizing that that person uh, made a mistake, or recognizing that they were caught in greed, hatred, or delusion, and therefore not sane. Um, and uh, acknowledging that that's not an inseparable part of who they are, that they can be different, they can change. Uh, no matter what they might have done in the past, they can, they can become different. Uh, but then also being realistic. Are they different? Uh, so if somebody has hurt you in the past and they haven't, don't seem to have made any significant progress in dealing with their issues, then odds are pretty good they're going to hurt you again if you give them the opportunity. So uh, practicing loving kindness does not obligate you to be somebody else's doormat. It doesn't obligate you to put yourself in harm's way. <coughs> um, on the other hand, if, uh, if someone seems to be genuinely repentant uh, and really is making a sincere effort to be a better person, then it, it's important to respect that. Uh, it's important to nurture that and to encourage that. So I'd recommend uh, looking at your mind. Uh, because the, this implies here, it says, forgotten and moved on, but there's some lingering emotion, not hatred, but annoyance. It sounds to me like there might be a little bit of resentment uh, hanging on, or a little bit of grudge, grudge holding, you know, or something of that sort. It's hard for me to say for sure, because there's not much information here. But I, I would encourage you, really look at that. Like, what is that that's continuing? 
because I, I think there might be might be a bit of a grudge there that hasn't yet been fully dealt with. Okay, next question. Does the end justify the means? For example, you said all lies weaken the... Uh, you write consciousness here, but I actually said conscience. And so conscience is the ability to discern right from wrong. Said all lies weaken the conscience. What if the lie was for the greater consciousness? I assume you mean the greater good. <coughs> um, such as when a German family hides a Jewish family during World War II. Obviously, the Nazis were not self-aware. To comply with their order would mean agreeing to their mindless state. Um, properly speaking, in that circumstance, uh, so it's, it's one of those uh, moral dilemmas that gets brought up from time to time. So, uh, assume that you're in Germany during World War II and you're hiding a Jewish family in your home. And the Nazis come to your door and uh, ask, do you, are you hiding any Jews here? And uh, so the question is, well, how can you deal with this situation with your moral integrity completely intact? Um, so, uh, optimally, you would actually find a way to send them away without directly lying. Uh, but if you did decide to lie, if you just did decide to say, no, there's no Jews here, or, there's, or you won't find what you're looking for here. Actually, if you said you won't find what you're looking for, that's technically a completely true statement. So that's actually a way you can deal with that particular dilemma. Trust me, I've heard this dilemma a million times. Um, you can find ways of talking which will get them to leave, but which do not involve directly lying. But assuming you did choose to directly lie, just say there are no Jews here, um, then you're incurring mixed karma. Uh, you're incurring a huge amount of good karma for protecting people from uh, torture and death. Um, and you're also incurring uh, a bit of bad karma from telling a lie. Um, so you're getting mixed karma, mostly on the side of the good, but still there is that little uh, bit of unwholesome mixed in in telling a lie. So, uh, one of the legends of the Buddha is that uh, for the last, I think, 500 lifetimes before he became a Buddha, he never told a lie. Um, and you won't find that in the suttas anywhere. It turns up in the commentarial literature later on. But it's something to give one pause. Uh, that uh, uh, of all the other things uh, he's said to have done in, in those last few hundred lifetimes, one thing that he stuck to is the principle of honesty. So it does indicate that there's, there's something to be, to be considered. What is it about the commitment to truth in that relationship to awakening? So keeping in mind that awakening is awakening to absolute truth. So a certain commitment to truth seems to naturally go hand in hand with that. Now, that doesn't mean being truthful in, uh, to, a, to a fault. Uh, so the Buddha also talks about time and place and manner. So just because you have something true to say doesn't mean you should necessarily say it. Uh, but rather you should consider if it's beneficial to say it, when the right time to say it is, uh, what the right circumstances would be, uh, and, and you might wind up not saying anything at all, which is also perfectly acceptable. Or, is it possible to tell where in the reincarnation process you are through intense and regular meditation? Um, I'll give you, uh, well, I'll just cut straight to the answer on this one. You are right where you are. You don't need to go through intensive meditation to realize you're right here, right now. Um, so, uh, properly speaking, so reincarnation process, this sounds more like what would come out of some form, like this kind of question, sounds uh, 
makes me think you might be studying Hindu philosophy or have some background in Hindu thinking because this doesn't quite line up with how Buddhism approaches the issue. So Buddhism doesn't see uh, rebirth as a process like leading in any particular direction. Like we don't see it as like a certain number of lifetimes ago you came into being and then you live a certain number of lifetimes and go through various experiences and then eventually, bam, you attain awakening automatically. Um, that's not the Buddhist perspective. That was one viewpoint which was going around at the time of the Buddha, and the Buddha rejected it outright. Right? He said, purity is not attained through samsara. It's not attained through rebirth. Uh, this is in uh, Majjhima Nikaya number 12, the Mahasi Hanada Sutta, the Greater Discourse on the Lion's Roar, magnificent sutta, I dearly adore it. Um, I know some people don't, but I love it, I love it with all my heart. And at one point, the Buddha just very directly states, uh, purity does not come through rebirth. In other words, no matter how many times you're reborn, no matter in how many different states of existence you're reborn, that by itself does not lead to enlightenment. We can just keep running in circles for eternity <coughs> without learning much of anything. In fact, that's what we've been doing, by the way. Uh, and elsewhere in the suttas, the Buddha also says that at one point or another, we've already experienced virtually everything imaginable. So clearly, just having a bunch of experiences also isn't sufficient to attain awakening. So it's not that we're at any particular point in the reincarnation process, because there's no point to the reincarnation process. It's inherently pointless, which is part of the purpose of Buddhist contemplation is to recognize the inherent pointlessness of samsara, the inherent pointlessness of the cycles of rebirth. That's another minor thing is that we generally use the word rebirth in Buddhism rather than the word reincarnation. Um, that said, uh, it is possible through, particularly through certain meditation practices, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, um, but Particularly through certain meditation practices, it's possible to start to recall your previous lives. And that can have a certain, certain amount of usefulness. Um, but it's kind of beside the point. It's not necessary. Um, and it can be a distraction. Uh, it's not necessary to attain awakening. Um, but it's something you can do if you want to. Let's see, next question. This is all from the same person, by the way. Uh, I heard enlightened beings can see into the past and future of their path to nirvana slash reincarnation process. Can they see others' process as well, i.e., can they see if you were going up or down? Um, again, I think there's a, there's a bit of Hinduism getting mixed into this question, so I'll answer it strictly from a Buddhist perspective. Uh, properly speaking, an enlightened being cannot see the future, uh, but what they can see is they can see the probable direction uh, that things will go in from here. So the Buddha said, for example, that he could look at any particular being, and he could tell if that person continued in their current patterns, he could tell what state of existence they would wind up in. So he could, he could look at, he could look at uh, this young gentleman, by the way. I know your name, but I'm not going to say it because we're on Facebook Live. <laughs> he could look at this young gentleman and say, like, based on how he acts, based on how his mind is developing, based on his habits and tendencies, he's going to be reborn as a deva. And then he might look at uh, this young lady and say, well, based on how she acts and how she thinks, she's going to be reborn as a cat. And then you look at this one and say like, well, based on how he's acting and how he behaves, he's going to become fully enlightened later on in this lifetime. So uh, that's assuming the person continues in their current patterns. So he might change his patterns. He might decide that he wants to become a serial killer and then go out and start killing people. And then he's probably not going to become a deva anytime soon. Uh, he might, depending on his past karma, but he would start stockpiling very negative karma that would take him in a different direction. Um, and she might start developing self-restraint, and she actually already has developed a fair amount of self-restraint. But she might start developing self-restraint and uh, 
cultivating wholesome qualities, and then instead of being a cat, she might come back to human birth, uh, or, or so on. So it, it's not that they can uh, see the future per se, but it's that they can <coughs> see the general direction that any one person's habits or tendencies are pointing towards. So from that they get predictions. Now from that they can make predictions. But those predictions are not absolute. Uh, they're dependent upon sentient beings, uh, and sentient beings make choices in every moment. However, they can... Uh, uh, many enlightened beings can recall their past lives. Not all, interestingly enough. <coughs> Uh, but many enlightened beings can recall their past lives. Um, and often they can uh, also look at, at other people and see other people's past lives as well. But again, not all, that's just some of them. Can they see if you're going up or down? Yes, they can. Uh, those who can see uh, the, the tendencies of a being can see what, uh, whether they're going uh, up into heaven realms, down into hell realms, or whether they're moving in the direction of awakening. Um, again though, that's not all awakened beings. That's just some of them have developed those particular abilities. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of variety among awakened beings. They all have the same basic wisdom in knowing, uh, they know absolute reality directly. So they understand the fundamental process by which the universe works. They all understand that basic truth in the same way. But different enlightened beings will have different, uh, different abilities, different mental qualities, different um, mm -hmm. aspects of their character, uh, different personalities actually, uh, that, that function in, in somewhat different ways. So they're not all carbon copies of each other. Uh, they, they have their own particular quirks. Um, okay, last question from this particular questioner. Um, does intent to create more happiness supersede motivation? For example, if I sell refrigerators to a developing country, my clear motive is to profit through business, but ultimately refrigeration gives people the power to store food, have hygienic cooking, etc. Healthier equals happier, but the people don't know that, so I have to resort to sales techniques that may seem selfish. Well, ultimately it depends on your motivation. If your motivation is to help people, then that's good karma. Um, if your motivation is to profit uh, <coughs> the uh, misfortune of others, then that's unwholesome, that's bad karma. So that's really what it comes down to, it comes down to your motivation. So your question, does intent to create more happiness supersede motivation? The question doesn't make sense, because intent to create more happiness is a motivation. That is part of intention. <coughs> so it's it's together, it's not separate. Next question. This one says, in your Dharma talk you talked about wrong views, such as thinking we'll be happier if we have more money, a dog, etc. Having a dog definitely won't make you happy. Uh, in my daily life, I notice I have wrong views, but often self-flagellate self or chastise. So what are wholesome methods we can use to correct or adjust away from habitual wrong views? Well, uh, first off, one thing that helps enormously is reading the suttas. Uh, I really can't emphasize this enough. Uh, read the suttas. They're really, really helpful. Um, so, the, the suttas present the way an enlightened mind perceives the world. So, as we read the suttas, what we notice is 
uh, over time, our worldview starts to shift to more closely match the worldview of an awakened being. So reading suttas is not separate from our spiritual practice. It is part of our practice. It is part of transforming the mind. It is part of training the mind. So some people think you read the suttas in order to help you get, uh, help you get information that you can then apply in the real practice, which is meditation. That's how some people see it. This is not accurate. Reading suttas is part of real practice. Meditating is part of real practice. Uh, living the precepts is part of real practice. These are, not, these are not separate. It's all part of real practice. Anything which helps to produce wholesome mind states is practice. Anything which helps direct the mind towards awakening is real practice. So reading the suttas is real practice. It transforms the mind and it helps orient the mind towards awakening. Uh, so that's something. Reading the suttas is a huge antidote to wrong view. Um, that said, I, I can think of a couple people who read the suttas and just got even more deeply stuck in wrong view. But these were individuals who read the suttas with the mind of rewriting them. They read the suttas with the idea of rewriting the suttas to match their opinions. That's a very harmful way to approach the suttas. So if you approach the suttas with the idea that there's something wrong with them that you have to fix, you're in for some trouble. But if you read the suttas as the words of an awakened being that can help you become an awakened being, then you'll find them extraordinarily beneficial. You'll find it really helps to, to reorient the mind. It really helps to cut through wrong view. Um, another huge antidote to wrong view is discussing the teachings with uh, wise people. So, uh, here uh, with this organization, we bring a lot of wise people here and you can talk to them. And that will help reorient your mind, it can help cut through wrong view. Um, meditation practice by itself will not necessarily cut through wrong view. The voice of another is often critical. Uh, discussion with another is often critical. The Buddha said there's two ways to cut through wrong view. Uh, one is the, uh, the voice of another, so listening to a teacher or reading the suttas. Uh, and the other is uh, wise attention, yonaso manasikara, wise attention. And wise attention is particularly paying attention to the Four Noble Truths. That's one of the ways the Buddha defines it anyway. It's viewing our lives through the lens of the Four Noble Truths. Who here knows what the Four Noble Truths are? Okay, so Four Noble Truths. First off, life is not perfect. It's frequently unsatisfying and um, is marked by discontent, dissatisfaction. Two, the source of that dissatisfaction is our desires. Three, the ending of desire is the ending of dissatisfaction. Or to put that another way, uh, when we let go of desire, we attain unconditional happiness. And for the way to uh, the ending of suffering, the way to the uh, attainment of unconditional happiness is through the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, so right view, right attitude, right speech, right action, right livelihood, uh, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So it's briefly, briefly the Four Noble Truths. But particularly, just contemplating the first three as we look at our lives uh, already tends to make a tremendous difference. So in this case, for example, thinking, uh, I would be happier if I had more money. And then we think, wait a minute, my desire for more money is making me unhappy. So if I just stop wanting more money, then I'm happy. Wow, that was easy. So that's that's viewing our lives in terms of the Four Noble Truths, well, the first three anyway. Um, the fourth one is realizing that the reason why we're able to see the first three is because we already have some degree of right view. We already have some degree of right attitude. Uh, hopefully we've been practicing 
right speech, right action, and right livelihood, though that's not a guarantee at this point. Um, though that tends to condition the mind. Uh, laying a, a foundation of morality tends to condition the mind to more readily accept right view, to more readily uh, take on right view. Um, also, uh, it's right effort to recognize our unwholesome tendencies and to try to let go of them. Uh, and it's right effort to cultivate wholesome tendencies. So we're also practicing that. Uh, right mindfulness, so awareness of our desire, awareness of the suffering, awareness that the suffering is caused by our desire. So again, uh, seeing the Four Noble Truths, uh, the first three Noble Truths, requires right mindfulness as well. Uh, and right concentration, so focusing the mind. Uh, focusing the mind on observing the mind, in this case. So then we can see how it's through practicing the Noble Eightfold Path that we're able to recognize the first three Noble Truths. So then, automatically, we have all four. <coughs> so this is an example of Yoniso Manasikara, of using a wise attention to cut through wrong view. That said, this is a bit more challenging because Part of what makes wrong view so difficult to deal with is that we're, generally speaking, we're quite taken in by it, we're quite convinced by it. Like, I actually do believe this wall is white. Well, slightly off-white. Uh, but for all I know, it might actually be blue, and it's just my delusion that makes me think it's off-white. How would I know otherwise? Uh, my belief that it's off-white may have conditioned my experience of the world. And this actually is uh, the Buddhist perspective, is that we're all experiencing a distorted perspective right now, every single one of us. Unless, are there any Buddhas in the room? Just checking. No? Okay. We're all experiencing a distorted perspective. And that distorted perspective is the result of our wrong view. And we believe our wrong view so sincerely that our experience of the world matches it. So this makes it, this is part of why it's difficult to cut through wrong view by yourself. Uh, this is why Pacheka Buddhas and Samasa Buddhas are so rare. So these are beings who break through wrong view by themselves. Very rare. Far more common are uh, Arhats or uh, Anu Buddhas, uh, people who attain awakening following the instructions of others. So it's much easier when somebody else points it out to you. It's much easier to uh, follow their instructions. So someone else is like, hey, dude, that wall is actually blue. Then I would be like, oh, you're right. It actually is blue. I don't know why I saw it as off-white all these months. Um, so having another pointed out to us can make a tremendous difference. Um, Yeah, another thing that tends to break through habitual wrong view is just sincerely, devotedly practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Because you'll start running up against things which mm, seem to conflict with elements of the Noble Eightfold Path. Like the whole, like, I would be happier if I had a dog. And it's like, well, but right attitude includes the attitude of renunciation. Uh, the attitude of renunciation is based on the idea that happiness is not found in getting things or having things. So then we would run up against that conflict where our non-Buddhist view, our, our non-Buddhist opinion that having a dog leads to more happiness, is running up in conflict with the Buddhist view that renunciation leads to happiness. So then, if we're being sincere about our Buddhist practice, then naturally we'll go with the Buddhist viewpoint. And then as we investigate it in our, in our life, then we can confirm it for ourselves. For example, I don't have a dog and I'm happy. If I did have a dog, I'd probably be less happy. What? Maybe not. I'd probably be fine, actually. <laughs> Let's see. This one says, Bhante, what are your five primary meditation techniques you spoke of? Uh, I mentioned those at the end of the last retreat. Um, so my main techniques are mindfulness of the body. Uh, particularly, I like to focus on my hands. Um, perception of impermanence. 
uh, which in its later stages becomes the perception of insubstantiality and the perception of emptiness, um, which I have to say is a huge barrel of fun. <laughs> Uh, if you're willing to watch everything that you think of as real dissolve, then it's a lot of fun. Okay, I got one laugh out of one person. That's more than I was expecting. Um, no, seriously, it's great. Perception of emptiness, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, loving kindness meditation, I do a lot of that because I'm grumpy. Um, if you haven't noticed that yet, you will, trust me. I'm working on it, but it's still there. Uh, and another one that I tend to do, not so much as a formal meditation technique, but something that I bring up in the mind all day long, is the recollection of peace. It's another technique the Buddha recommends that I found extremely useful. Next question. I recently said that the Buddha, I recently read that the Buddha said stealing, deceiving, adultery, this is defilement, not eating meat. I assume you're paraphrasing because that doesn't sound precisely like a quote, but that's okay. Sutta Napata 242 it says, um, could you give me the Sutta Napata someone? Sutta Napata should be on the shelf there. The what? Sutta Nipata. It should be a slender one. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, not very slender. <coughs> Here we go. Uh, this was actually the Buddha Kasapa, so a previous Buddha, um, rather than the Buddha Gotama. So Gotama was the most recent Buddha, Kasapa was one of the previous Buddhas. For those who don't know, there have been countless Buddhas extending back into the uh, <coughs> mists of beginningless time. So the Buddha Kasapa said, destruction of life beating, mutilating, binding, theft, false speech, fraudulence and cheating, studying useless objects, studying useless subjects. Oh, that's cute. Studying useless subjects. I did a lot of that in school. <laughs> <laughs> Resorting to the wives of others. That's an awfully clumsy way to say adultery. <laughs> um, so studying useless subjects, uh, adultery, this is carrion, so rotting meat. This is rotting flesh, but not the eating of meat. And he goes on in this quite a bit. Uh, oh, the reason this comes up is because uh, a Brahmin asked the Bodhikasapa why the Bodhikasapa was eating meat. Um, and then the Bodhikasapa goes through explaining why... Uh, eating meat itself is not the problem, um, but it's all these other unwholesome... I I'm just going to read through this whole section, this is great. Uh, for the record, I'm, I'm myself mostly vegetarian, but it's, it, it's a subject that comes up from time to time in Buddhism, so it's important to reflect on what it actually says in the suttas. People here, uncontrolled and sensual pleasures, greedy for tastes, mixed up with impurity, who hold a nihilist view, who are warped and stubborn. This is carrion, but not the eating of meat. Uh, those who are rough, violent, backbiters, betrayers of friends, I've known some of those, cruel-hearted, arrogant, miserly, who do not give to anyone, I've definitely known some of those. This is carrion, but not the eating of meat. Anger, vanity, obstinacy, recalcitrance, hypocrisy, envy, and boastfulness, haughtiness, and intimacy with the bad. This is carrion, but not the eating of meat. This guy was a poet. <laughs> Those ill-behaved debt evaders, slanderers, crooked in their dealings, dissemblers, vile men who here commit wicked deeds. 
This is carrion, but not the eating of meat. Those people here are uncontrolled toward living beings who steal from others intent on inflicting harm, immoral, cruel, harsh, disrespectful. This is carrion, but not the eating of meat. Those who are greedy towards these, hostile, transgressors, ever intent, who are heading for darkness after death, beings who fall headfirst into hell, this is carrion, but not the eating of meat. Neither avoiding fish and meat, nor fasting, nor nakedness, a shaven head, matted locks, dirt, or rough antelope hides, nor tending the sacrificial fire, or the many austerities in the world aimed at immortality, sacred hymns, oblations, sacrifices, and seasonal penances, purify a mortal who has not overcome doubt. So in other words, none of these things, including vegetarianism, he lists here, will uh, bring purity. One guarded over the sense doors should live with sense faculties understood, firm in Dhamma, delighting in honesty and mildness. A wise one who has overcome the ties, who has abandoned all suffering, is not tainted by things seen and heard. Okay. Um, it's lovely. I really need to read the Sutta Napatan again. I haven't read it in quite some time. Um, so the question continues. Does this mean the Buddha was not vegetarian? Um, isn't eating meat harmful to sentient beings? Uh, apparently, no. <laughs> um, so, the Buddha makes some distinctions here. Uh, so, elsewhere in the suttas, he does lay out a few things very clearly. One, killing animals is unwholesome. Torturing and mistreating animals is unwholesome. So the people who run animal farms are incurring a huge stockpile of bad karma. Uh, and then we can make gradations, of course. On, on the one extreme we have factory farms, which are one of the most abysmal things present on this earth these days. Um, and that's incurring a tremendous amount of bad karma. Uh, then we have uh, humane farms, so where the animals are, are at least treated with uh, dignity and respect and given a relatively comfortable life uh, before uh, eventually being slaughtered. Um, so there's still bad karma there, the bad karma of killing, but at least there's not the bad karma of, of torturing and mistreating. Um, but in, in both these cases then, the again, the animal farmer is incurring bad karma. Uh, so. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, though, we have someone who is simply given a gift of food, and that food happens to contain meat. So that's the case of the Buddha Kasapa, for example. The Buddha Kasapa, in this case, was given, uh, given a gift of food. Someone gave him a meal, and the meal happened to contain meat, and the Buddha Kasapa was eating the meat. When this Brahmin was like, what are you doing? That's bad. And, and the Buddha Kasapa is like, actually, no, it's not. Uh, so, in that case, there's clearly no fault. Uh, so, it's just someone who's given a gift, and they received the gift, and made use of it. Where we get into a more challenging subject is not around the eating of meat, but around the buying of meat. So, the Buddha does list selling meat as wrong livelihood. Uh, so, that's clearly on the side of, of bad karma. Uh, but uh, buying meat is, uh, the, the argument that's made here is that one is mm, implicitly supporting uh, the mistreatment and killing of animals. Um, and that's where I can, I can see a, a reasonable argument. Though it's interesting that I, I don't think I've seen anywhere in the suttas where the Buddha directly addresses that point. <coughs> He directly addresses the point of buying meat. Uh, within the monastic code, he does specify that we should not eat an animal that was killed specifically for us. Uh, so if someone would, told me, I'm going to go out and kill a deer and then bring it and feed it to you, then I would have to say, no, that's not acceptable. Uh, or even if somebody showed up at the door and was like, here, I caught these fish for you. I would still have to say no, because it was killed specifically for me. Um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting, I, I don't 
I can't think of anywhere the, where the Buddha specifically addressed the question of buying meat. But this is one sutta where he does make it clear that eating meat itself is not karmically uh, reprehensible. That said, I do encourage vegetarianism uh, because uh, out of compassion for all sentient beings, uh, it is not acceptable to support the mistreatment and, and slaughter of animals. It's not something that we can condone. Um, that said, if you're a dedicated carnivore, then at least make an effort to uh, buy meat from humane farms. Um, it's at least reducing the harm that's being done. So it's cutting out the mistreatment part. Um, you're still supporting the slaughtering of sentient beings, but at least you're reducing, reducing the awfulness by one step. Um, and optimally to aim it at not purchasing meat as much as possible, um, because there's, there's really no point in supporting those industries. Um, unless you happen to find uh, a meat purveyor which only sells meat from animals that die of natural causes, then I see absolutely nothing morally wrong with that. That seems to be totally <coughs> A-OK. -okay. How would you work with a mind that continually proliferates with doctrine? And it gives a list of questions such as, is this original? In the sutta it says, is this the best meditation for my temperament? Relax, just do the practice. Uh, true faith comes through experience. So just keep doing the practices and see what happens. This says, I love that you have a Christmas tree. Is that not in conflict with Buddhist tradition? Is the angel on top a deva? I certainly think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my favorite depiction of devas, but it's cute. Uh, I'm on board. Um, realistically, I think that when, uh, when other traditions talk about angels, they're just talking about the same thing we mean when we say devas. Uh, I don't really see a distinction. Uh, realistically, virtually any tradition of um, spirits or gods or uh, angels, fairies, pixies, genies, all that stuff, it all just fits under devas uh, in the Buddhist category. And, and even within devas, there's a lot of variety that's mentioned in Buddhism, which I won't go into. Uh, I believe Ajahn Punadamo wrote uh, a fairly detailed study on all the different kinds of devas. Um, have you? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Idea. No. Okay. I don't know if it's published yet or not. It was circulating on the internet a while back. So, Christmas tree. Is a Christmas tree in conflict with Buddhist tradition? Well, the bigger question is: Is it in conflict with Christian tradition? Because uh, the <laughs> what? <laughs> um, because uh, the tradition of cutting down a pine tree and putting it in your house has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, it was actually something that came from Germanic paganism, uh, which, I mean, who cares, realistically? Um, it's a pretty tree, and it's in here now. Um, but that's dodging your question. Uh, so it's been identified with Christmas for quite some time now. Uh, well, the question is... Uh, what do we mean by Christmas? And as I see it, there's basically two separate holidays which happen to occur on the same day. Um, I see Giovanna glaring at me. <laughs> um, so there's a Christian holiday, which is celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, which is fine. He was a nice guy, and he said some really nice things. Um, and then there's a... Uh, mm, you might call it a secular or non-religious holiday, which is primarily about generosity and gift-giving and mutual appreciation, which actually lines up extremely well with Buddhist values. So generosity, mutual appreciation, sharing with each other, celebrating family and friends, these are all things which uh, are, are fully in accordance with Buddhist tradition. I don't see any problem at all 
I don't see any conflict at all. Um, as far as, um, let's see, is that not in conflict for just tradition? Yeah, no conflict. No conflict. Uh, next question. So this is a question for Giovanna. Um, you mentioned being Italian. Italy is often regarded as a very Catholic country. How does your family feel about your Buddhist practice? Do they understand and support you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very Catholic country, that is true, but... Um, Uh, I think this country is a little bit more religious than Italians, paradoxically. And anyway, never mind. No, uh, no, go with that. Go with that. <laughs> That's an interesting thing. Um, uh, okay, answer her what you want. I won't get involved. <laughs> anyway, my family is not uh, terribly happy about my Buddhist practice because I. They don't really understand what it is, or nor are they particularly interested in learning what it is. Um, so, no, they do not understand nor support me. <laughs> but I do it anyway. <laughs> I was under the impression that they're more annoyed that you're not making any money than yeah. that you're Buddhist per se. Yeah, apparently also if I were into... Um, Christian monasticism, they would feel the same way because it has similar values of poverty. <laughs> yeah, I, I think your family is less... Their religion is not Catholicism so much as money. Uh, well, it's more scientific materialism, which seems to be the number one religion um, these days. Okay, well, that's all the questions. <laughs> Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, we'll do some meditation.